Awesome. Hi. Hello. I'm so excited to be able to have an interview with you. <laughs> I am as well. Yay. Absolutely. It's finally happening. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> How are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? I am well. I, I got a lot of friends. That was good. And um, I've just been working on, you know, setting up interviews and, and working on creating a, a webinar series we're going to do for some authors who are hashtag staying at home. <laughs> That's everybody. How are, oh, how are you doing in the time of coronavirus? How am I doing? I'm doing well. Uh, we got a lot of stuff. We made you know, a lot of supplies and stuff. And I've just been trying to create, like, little creations of, like, food, the food that we have, you know, to ration it, but also make nice, lovely meals and stuff. I think I'm posting some more pictures. I posted one so far of things I've made. I like to cook. Oh, same here. Yeah. Um, yesterday, I did this curry that was just, like, I, you know... Ah! Sometimes, like, you know, like, when you cook something and you're like, man, I'm good. Like, it was one of those days where I was like, yes. <laughs> I'm really good. <laughs> I have skills. <laughs> yes. Oh, yes. Yes, definitely. I had a curry chicken once with some polenta. Oh, my gosh. It was the first time I really had curry. It was so good. What type of curry was it? I don't even know. It was, does it make a difference what color it was? It was orange. <laughs> no. I don't really know, <laughs> but it was lovely. I really want to recreate it. I've been getting into making a uh, golden, um, golden hummuses with turmeric and cumin. And these uh -huh. Oh yes, those are delicious. I love them. Like, do you? Ha if you have a ninja, that just like that just makes your hummus game so much. Because like I love making hummus, but like um, my blenders would like sort of stop because of the. But, like, having a ninja just makes making hummus amazing. Wow, I do have a ninja. I always make it in the food processor. Yeah, the ninjas make it much easier. Ooh, I gotta try that next time. Thank you for the tip. <laughs> I'm excited, too. This is gonna be good. I have some chickpeas and tahini, too. I can even try it today. Oh, yay. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I'm looking down, and I'm seeing somebody from, here from Iran. Yeah. Like. I know there's so many. Hi. <laughs> we're going, we're going, we're streaming around the world. Oh, awesome, awesome! Everybody, like, I hope that you're safe out there. Like, this thing is awful, and I know it is just rippling like through the entire world. So, like, everybody out there, I hope you're safe. I hope you're with your family and your loved ones, and that you're. Um, remaining self-quarantine also um just to fyi to everybody like it's airborne stays in the air for three hours so if you go outside like you know take off your clothes put them elsewhere and don't touch them and like wash like everything stay outside for 72 hours at least 72 hours yeah well I'm praying everybody is safe out there because this is just yeah absolutely me too and um, staying safe and staying healthy and, and, and trying to trying to stay self-quarantined with your families and, you know, really try to enjoy this time while we're, you know, trying to keep everyone protected and well yeah. around the world, not even just in America, but around the world. Thank you for that. I'll go ahead and start asking questions for the interview. Yay. All right. So what did you want to be as a child and was it an author? I honestly um, did not want to be an author when I was a child because I didn't realize that was like an actual profession people could do, you know, like, so I always thought I was going to be like, I thought I was going to like do something in international diplom diplomacy, same as like my parents and like all my family. Um, so I was all like, you know, go to law school like um, get into like some international organization and just sort of do that path. And honestly, it was only when J.K. Rowling came out that I realized, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. People can actually like make money off of writing and it's an actual career. Yeah. Oh, so. Yes. So, so that she was able to kind of inspire you to, to make yeah. your your, your, your 
profession in life. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. And then, but like then, like that was sort of like a problem because like I thought, like you know, I thought publishing when I first like started learning, I thought publishing was like, oh, you do this and then you get in and then you. No, it's not like that at all. But like, yes, just that gave me the inspiration to be like, that's what I can do. Because I've always had stories and I just thought that I was like maybe a little bit crazy, which I think is like a regular writerly thing. Like you have all these stories running through your head and you need some outlet for them. Yeah. yeah I always have stories and I'm always jotting down things. I have stories, like I have little outlines of stories like here and there. And then I have full chap like introductory chapters. I had opening and the ending, but at the middle, um, finished manuscripts, like my debut novel that's coming out, uh, The Beth Brothers. Um, it is like, every time every time I'm sitting somewhere, it's like I can, it can inspire an idea. I write it down. Because it's <laughs> another story in the making. Yeah. Yes. Um, what does a day in the life of Anina look like? Um... Well, right now I'm in Georgia because um, I came here to visit my mom who was having some health problems, and now I'm sort of stuck because coronavirus. Um, but usually, um, if I'm in LA, which is where I live, um, I wake up, if I'm not super on deadline, then I wake up at 6. If I am super on deadline, then it's anywhere from 2 to 4 a.m. Um, I usually try to write um, 10 pages per day. So like, that's how I sort of budget my books. I'm like, um, if I write 10 pages today, then I know this is when the book will, this is when I'll be done with the book, like banking on having around 400 pages. Um, but yeah, so wake up early, like write immediately. Like I don't even, I just like stay in bed writing. Um, then around 10 o'clock, I go get breakfast, um, uh, like answer emails, go like take a walk or something. Then around two, I come back um, and I start writing again. And usually I'm in there till like um, eight or nine o'clock and then I go to bed. So that's my usual day. Just productive, and I wish I could wake up and start writing like that. I wish I could be disciplined enough to wake up and just start writing like 10 pages. Is it 10 pages a day at least? Yeah. Well, I think like it depends on like your circadian, is that how you pronounce it? Circadian rhythm? Yeah. So like, I mean, I am a person who goes to sleep early and wakes up early. And I think that if you're trying to do that, then you have to like really understand where when you're most productive like I'm most productive either early in the morning or um or later in the evening so like anything that I would do between like the hours of like say 11 to like three or four o'clock is not really going to be as good as if it was in the hours that I'm actually really writing it's so good you, you know you know your 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 how, how your inspiration comes to you, what times of the day. Mine is totally the opposite. Like, I lay down, go to sleep, and I'm suddenly writing until like four or five o'clock in the morning. I don't even realize it. And I'm most productive in the wee hours of the morning. And I wish I would wake up early and be able to write like that. I would prefer to be that way instead. The way that you are, you wake up. Mm -hmm. Yes. I am up in the wee hours of the, the morning after staying up all day. And for some reason, that's when I'm most productive. Like, I can crank out entire chapters during that time. So most of the time, I can't. And most of the things that I've written came from that, that time of the night. Then you have to sort of hold, hold those hours a secret. Like, for me, like, I know that I will probably not answer an email. Like, everything for me, like, especially when I'm writing, everything is on silent. Um, so like it's, and if it's like crunched writing time, I'm really like not answering like most things because like all of my brain power, all of my everything is just there. That makes sense. That makes sense. So you don't interrupt it well. Yeah. Awesome. Very cool. Um, so what do you use to inspire you when you get writer's block? Um, honestly, like if I get writer's block, um, I... I typically just stop writing. 
Um, because I know like if I'm getting writer's block, it's because of something that I'm not addressing in my life that's giving me anxiety. So I figure out what that is and then I get back to it. But honestly, usually like if I am um, like if I've been writing, writing, writing and I, I, my brain is exhausted, then what I do is I watch anime to like, like sort of clean my mind before I go into the next chapter or what have you. I listen to a lot of music. <laughs> yeah. And I do a lot of reading too because I'm a book blogger, so I have a lot of a lot of arcs on hand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I um I, I read a lot of those and then I also listen to a lot of music because I have music that's like playlists, full playlists dedicated to each and every story and sometimes each and every character. And oh yeah. Yes, yeah, so I listen to songs associated with them to inspire me. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, definitely, like, playlists, like, honestly, like, I am a writer who works in complete silence, like, I I can't go and write at coffee shops, I can't go, like, I, I have to be in complete, in a completely sort of stable and sterile environment, but when I am crafting a story, um, I use uh, music and art to, like, sort of inspire me to be ready to get where I want to go. I usually listen to music before I start writing, but not during. Mm -hmm. Like silence, too. Yeah. Yes, yes. So for you, what would you say, coffee or tea? Oh, I'm definitely a tea person all the way. Um, and I love the fancy teas. I love the whole thing about tea, like the teacups, like making it like, yeah, I love tea, basically. My sister lives in Japan, and so they've gone through a lot of tea ceremonies there. I drink a lot of mine. <laughs> I love coffee and tea. Like I always have to have vanilla macchiato in the morning. I make it for I make the syrup for it, the vanilla syrup, and then I use uh, the organic milk that comes from where I I, I moved from North Carolina, and um and I always have a vanilla macchiato, probably another espresso drink throughout the day, and then hot tea at night. So how do you make the syrup? The syrup is one part water, one part sugar, and then it's boiled mm -hmm. with a sticky like a sticky syrupy consistency. And then just like a teaspoon of vanilla extract, it's, like, mm -hmm. it's good. It's so good. <laughs> it's better than any of the syrups I've purchased. So I love making it. And I always, uh, like every three days, I have to make some more. And I store Whoa. it in there fresh. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you. I love it a lot. I love, I love making anything. It's like I can make it and not buy it. I want it. <laughs> um, so in your opinion, what is your favorite movie or TV adaptation? Um, hands down has to be Harry Potter because um, it, like, the way how it was in the book is how it felt like it was in the movie. And I think that the movie even added sort of spice to the book. Like, with that, um, that score was just amazing. Like, those, that music is, like, instantly recognizable. So, yeah. Definitely made it, yeah. That's wonderful. It is a very good, a very, very good adaptation. Um, my favorite is The Silence of the Lambs. Oh, uh, yeah, that's that's another one. Um, and then also Game of Thrones. Um, although, to be honest, I haven't quite read the books, but <laughs> I feel like, man, like they're sitting there. One day I will have time to get through those. <laughs> Yes, and I hear they're not even finished. <laughs> they're still not even done. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. I hear the TV show deviated from the books in the later, mm -hmm. the later um, seasons, but mm -hmm. they still um, resemble the books a lot. So still, yeah. they're very, it's a very good one. It, it, it had such dynamic and such a draw globally yeah. for people. It was very good. It was very good. The end of it was a little iffy, but it's good. <laughs> Would you like to tell us what your book is about? Um, so my book is called The Gilded Ones. Um, it is set in um, a world that um, that imagines if West Africa conquered the globe. So it's like an ancient type world. And in this world, um, every girl when they turn 16 um, must go through a ritual to determine if their blood is pure or not. Um, pure means red blood. 
in pyramids, gold blood. And the girls who have gold blood are faster, stronger um, than regular humans, and each has only one way they can die. And because of this, people think that they're demons. And the whole idea is you like, if you see an impure girl, you figure out how it dies, and then you kill it. Um, problems arise when actual demons start sort of invading this empire. And so my main character, who discovers that she's one of these impure girls, they're known as Alaki, which means um, unwanted or worthless. Um, she's given a choice by this woman. She's given a choice by a mysterious woman. Either come and fight against these demons or remain here in this temple where they're like trying to kill you and eventually they'll figure it out and you'll die here. And so, of course, she chooses to go and um, the repercussions of that sort of have a ripple effect in her like understanding what's happening with like girls like her, the world, etc. That is fantastic. I'm intrigued and drawn in already. Yay! So basically, it's like if you put like the Amazon, like if you put like the Dora Milaje or like the Amazons of Wonder Woman in the world of The Handmaid's Tale, like that's what it is. Oh my gosh! I never would have thought of those two things together, but yes, that's what that is. Yeah, is, and it's that's perfect. <laughs> I read that. That's great. Oh my gosh! I have so many ideas for a book trailer for that. <laughs> I don't think I make book trailers on my uh, social media for people. Oh my gosh, I love that. I I I I gotta post about that for sure. <laughs> that is amazing. How did you think of it? What inspired it? Um. So, when I was in undergrad, um, I would have recurring dreams of like this girl, like she's wearing golden armor. She's like has a sword in hand, and she's walking up this hill. It's sort of like epic slow motion. Um, there's a battle going on underneath the hill. She, like, jumps up, sort that sword um, aimed, and, like, three, remember 300? So, like, she jumps up slow motion, 300 style, and, like, the dream cuts out. And um, undergrad for me was I went to Spelman College, which is all black, all female, and it's right next to Morehouse, which is all black, all male. And so I think sort of, like, the, the seeds of... Um, of the Gilded Ones were formed there. But like the actual moment that I got the idea was like, it was, I think um, first year, second semester of film school, which had to have been like 2011, around 2011 or so. I'm sitting in this, I'm sitting in class um, and all of a sudden these words fall into my head. I was nine years old when first I learned I could not die. And I started writing furiously, and from that came, like, the first iteration of The Gilded Ones. I love yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. That's amazing. Congratulations on that, being your, being your release and, and, and having that story and, and being inspired to write that story just dropped to your head. The dream just came to you, and there it was. It's amazing. I love Thank it. Thank you. Um, do you plan your books in advance, or do you let them uh, uh, develop as you write? I'm somewhere in the middle, um, in that, like, I definitely have very, very detailed outlines. My outlines um, are, like, 10 pages long. Mm -hmm. uh, so, like, I already know, like, where, like, the entire trilogy ends. Like, and, and, and typically when I have an idea, I know the start point and I know the end point, and it's figuring out the middle um with this book i already know where it ends and i already know like all the iterations however i find that like even though my outlines are very sort of detailed there's a lot that i discover in the actual writing because like my outlines are then she does this and then she does this and she's feeling this or whatever but like i don't know certain things until like i get into the writing of it it's like those little details come to you later, but the major details are already laid out. Yeah. I know how that is, yes. I, I feel like I write a lot of my books like that, too. It's like I need yeah. to know the foundation of the story, but I can add the little aesthetics as I go. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I, I need to have a map, though, to the end. I need to know. I need to have an idea of where it's going. I oh, yeah. No, definitely. Maps, like, I think if you don't have a map, you get lost. And, um, yeah, that's the, yeah. 
Yes, I don't understand the Panthers. <laughs> I don't understand how they how it works for them. They have that mad chaotic energy, and God bless them. I appreciate them very much. <laughs> what does the act of writing mean to you? Um, a lot of things. Um, for me, I think like for me, writing is almost a spiritual thing. Um, in that I tend to feel like everybody in this world has like a purpose. Um, and your purpose could be like. I want to have kids and like, I want to raise kids or whatever. But I think for me, writing is my purpose. And like in doing so, like I'm fulfilling what I was meant to do. And so like every time I'm sort of writing, like I just, it's the time where I am most, ha I, it's the time I'm happiest. Like when I'm in another world and I'm creating worlds and whatever, like that's where my peace is. You know what I mean? Like, that's my touchstone. Me too. Yeah. yeah. I know exactly how that feels. It's like, um, it's like there's, it's like it's a centering. Yeah. 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 Like, if I'm not writing, then I feel out of sorts. And I'll just, like, I, like, I don't know um, which one is more obnoxious, like, when I'm writing or when I'm not writing. Because those are two very different. Can you, can you say obnoxious? Obnox no, I'm trying to make a word here, but it's not quite happening. Obnoxiosities? No, like, yeah, no, whatever. Okay. Like, <laughs> huh? Obnoxiousness. I, no, but that's the word that already exists. Like, I was trying to make something up, but then it didn't work. Yeah. Oh, obnoxi obnoxities? Obnoxiosities? Obnoxiosities? Two different obnoxiosities. There you go. Put that one in the dictionary. Yes, coined right here, Instagram line. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm like, if anybody, if anybody takes this, like, um, now I'm in a four and a half p.m. Exactly. Exactly. It was. It was heard first. Created first. Right here. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what has been the hardest thing about publishing for you, and what has been the most fun? The hardest thing has been the rejections. Um, I decided to be a writer when I was, um, I think, 19, because it was 2006. That was when I was like, okay, this is where I belong, what I should be doing with my life. Um, and I was like, okay, I'm going to get out there and write novels and get to it. So, like, I immediately start writing. Um, and... Of course, like my first few novels sucked, but just even when I got better, um, when I got, I, I think, professional, it was still the rejections and it wasn't rejections based on craft. It was rejections based on who I was and who the main characters in my novels were. Like, I always tell people, I'm like, you don't understand how big a deal Black Panther was. Like, um because Black Panther, like, completely changed the zeitgeist and sort of opened up people's minds to understand that there is something there in, like, um, worlds that are not European, you know? Um, so to, like, give credit to that and also to, um, what is, what was Jordan Peele's, like, first movie? Um, Get Out. Because Get Out was, Get Out primed Black Panther and Black Panther exploded everything, Right. Um, so before that, like, literally, um, it didn't matter, I don't think, how good I was. Um, and for a lot of, like, writers of color, it was the same. It didn't matter how good you were. Um, what matters was that what you were writing was not marketable. And so I would get rejections. Like, I would get, like, two, three rejections a day. And I was in film school, so I'd get rejections. Um, or even after film school, I get rejections from the novel side and rejections from the film side. Um, and that was that was really, really painful because at some point I knew it wasn't about um, my craft because I knew like from being a script reader and being a like and reading like novels for studios that my work was just as good, if not better. And I was like, what's the missing what's the the thing that's lacking here and I understood what it was yeah yeah that makes sense I, I understand completely 
actually that was very hard to know that your work has had had all the quality and more and just still not be accepted yeah it was very yeah. cool and frustrating and upsetting yeah because in that so so sorry Quentin yeah and it feels it feels you know the unfairness of it Yeah. Oh yeah. Cuz I mean imagine the Gilded Ones was written in like 2011, 2012. So like it was already like I think ready to go at like then, but you know, so. Yeah. What has been the most fun thing about publishing for you? The best thing for me is the readers. Like honestly, like having readers, like having actual people that are not my family members and not my friends read my book. is just like the best thing ever. Like I appreciate every time somebody reads, every time somebody like leaves um um leaves like a review, even if it's like even if it's like a bad review, like to me I'm like this person still read and I always like um honestly that's the other thing I love is reviews because even if it's a bad review I'm like there's things that I can learn from this. Like um and I can obviously pick out what's objective and what's not, but like um Uh, there's always stuff that I'm like, okay, I see you, I hear you. Um, I'm gonna go back and work on this and make it better for you next time. So, like, I love that's the best thing. That's fine. That's fine. Um, uh, between you and your readers, your fans, the reviewers, the bloggers who read your work and enjoy it, that's gotta be so fulfilling and validating. Oh yeah. Exciting. That. That is the best thing ever. Like that's the thing that makes it all like, yeah. Makes it worthwhile. Do you have stories on the back burner that are waiting to be written? Oh my gosh! Uh, I am so excited because um, after the Gilded One series, like I hope that my next book out. Um, so I have a book um, called The Last Leviathan. Um, it's middle grade. It's set completely underwater. It's about a young merman who discovers this cute little creature that he takes on as a pet. What he doesn't realize is that it's a leviathan, like which like will em- will eventually go to enorm grow to enormous size. It's basically like Godzilla underwater, or that it's like the very last one. So like now he has to go on this epic journey to protect it against like shark shark merfolk, and, like all these people who want to use it to take over the ocean. That's gonna be very visual and exciting. It's like a, it's like an action adventure. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, I love middle grade um, very very much, and I'm excited to like get into that and to do like and like also the world of the last Leviathan is one that I've had for since I was a teenager, and like I know everything about mermaids. I read every mermaid book that there is, so this is like my geekdom, like. Like my biggest geekiest thing is mermaids. So yeah. Is is there is there mermaid anime? Um yeah, there is one um that I liked. It was called Mermaid Forest. Um, this is like an old one, and it's basically um based on the myth of the Japanese ninkyo, um which is like the Japanese mermaid, and like the whole idea is you you eat mermaid flesh either. You die, you become this monstrous creature, or you become immortal. And so, um, Mermaid Forest sort of examines the re- repercussions of what happens when people eat mermaid flesh. And I just thought that was such a great way to like examine that because it was creepy and it was it went hard. That was a great anime. <laughs> I bet it did go hard. Um, it seems almost borderline cannibal a little bit. Oh yeah. Just eating mermaids because they seem like they're mostly human. <laughs> I mean, like, no, this this anime went like all kind of different ways. Like, there were serial killers. It was like mermaids eating people, people eating mermaids. Like, it is not for the faint of heart. Like, and also there was this one kid in the anime that was just like the like you know how like there's like kids like Damien and like whatever. Like this kid, like of all the monstrous kids in like all of media that I've ever read or watched, was just like. The one that went the hardest. I was just like, bro, oh, wow. like, because yeah, I was just like, you need to watch it because I don't want to spoil what this kid was. But I was just like, Jesus Christ, what is this? It was great. I loved it. I gotta look that up because my sister, you know, she was. I was just saying she lives in Japan, 
And a lot of, you know, anime comes from Japan, and they're learning Japanese over there. And I'm going to learn Japanese after I finish my last, my last year of my、uh, graduate degree program, because I'm going to do my master's in counseling.、Mm-hmm. I'm going to learn Japanese, because they'll be my niece, my nephew, my sister, everyone will be fluent when they come back. I want to speak Japanese with them. And, oh, like, awesome. Yes. I would love to learn about the,、uh, even the anime, the anime and the culture. Yeah, like I am definitely an anime buff. I watch it all the time. I feel like I have an ear for Japanese now, even though like, I don't necessarily want to learn it because I'm learning French right now. And if I add Japanese to the mix, I'm going to lose a language. So, yeah. <laughs> I want to get lost in there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>、um, what advice would you give to budding writers? Aim for 500 rejections. That's the first thing. Because,、um, like, the most painful thing I think for writing is rejection. Like, and a lot of people don't know how to take it. It's like, because it feels like, it feels like it's personal. Like, when your work gets rejected, it's not just your work, you feel like you're the one being rejected. So, I think, like,、um, for beginning writers, aim for 500 rejections. Hold it as a mark of honor. Like, I've gotten a hundred and so rejections. Yes, I've gotten, you know, because that sort of keeps you going. Because, like, the 500 rejections,、um, like, lets you know that, okay, I'm like, I'm not quite there yet, but I'm going to get there, you know? Like, and the other thing is, like, understand that a rejection, hi there, is a rejection for now, not a rejection for always. It's just for right now.、Um, So, just be like, okay, it's for today, but it's not for tomorrow, and you keep it pushing.、Um, the other thing I would say is like, know when to move on to the next project. Like, for me, if I query a book or what have you, and I'm not getting anywhere, it, it doesn't matter how much I love it or I think it's good or whatever. I'm like, okay, put it aside and keep working on the next thing. I think that has sort of served me like very, very well in that, like, I have a backlog of projects that are already done and already completed and already sort of at professional capacity that I don't have to go back and, like, now I can go, go out and be like, okay, here you go.、Um, so just like work on your backlog, work on having, like, going to the next project because just think of each project as I've learned this on this project, apply it to the next project and just watch your writing grow. Oh, also, Yes, right, girl?、Uh, yes. I see you, Louisa.、Uh, also, the other thing I would say、um, oh my gosh, I just lost my train of thought.、Um, so, work on the next project. Darn it, lost my train of thought.、Hi. Louisa, you did this to me. <laughs> Louisa, could you? <laughs>、um, the, um, so, knowing when to move on,、um, also knowing,、um, working on your backlog at all times, continuing to develop. Your writing, community development, art? Yeah, I, I figured out what it was. Okay, so the other thing, and like this is super important for budding writers, is you are only as good as your critique partners. Writing is not a vacuum. Like, yes, we're all here in our PJs, like doing our 5 a.m. writers' call or whatever, but like we depend on the strength of our critique partners, like the strength of their writing. So find your critique partner. Who is better than you in writing and then aspire to that? Like, it's great when you're starting out and it's just like your family and friends, but like they're not actual writers. And like, granted, like for me, I think that every, every, every reader has a point. Like, when they say a note, when they give you a note, it might be a note that seems stupid, but you have, you as the writer have to like think in the background. Like, listen to what they're actually saying and translate that and be like, oh, this is the actual note, and then apply it, right?、Um, because, like, the, the critiquing is a language, and not everybody knows it. Like, everybody knows when something is wrong, or most, rather, most people know when something is wrong, but not everybody has the language of critiquing, which is why you need other writers who can be like, this is exactly what this is. You know what I mean? Yes.、Um, Like, I am very fortunate. My critique partner,、um, PJ Schweitzer,、um, she, like, I'm not good with emotions, like the softer, finer feelings in writing books. Like, I'm great with building worlds. I'm great with fight sequences. 
but when it comes to like the the part of things like the like my critique partner PJ Schweitzer is like a genius at that um and so like I depend on her to be like Madam I tap tap like you need to go back and dig into the the feelings here because you're not quite there yeah wow I've had two beta readers but I would love to have a critique partner at some point I, I'm still publishing fall 2020 but I always wanted to have a uh, that 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 back and forth with a critique partner and get someone to really like inspect every little detail in order to critique it I've had the beta readers but CP would be fantastic I would love that like well, so I like, here's the th other thing is like you have different people for different things, right? So like I have people who when I have an idea, um, I talk it out with them immediately. Like when I feel it brimming inside me, like I call like my friend Loretta because she like she is like just a cheerleader and she's also great at like she's like the person that I spitball off of all the time. I call her, I call Amanda Griswold, and I just spitball like off of them, bounce ideas back and forth. And then I sit down and I write the synopsis uh, um, or outline or whatever, I get lost in these words. And then I send it back to them for their approval before I share with the um, greater world. And then like, and also I don't send back chapters because um, I just, I don't know, like, I feel like that takes too short. Like, what I do is, like, I always send back the first two chapters to make sure that the voice is right, like, um, and then from there, I send the full work. Um, so, yeah, and that's mainly PJ. Wow, wow, that is such a gift. That is such a, a wonderful, um, to be able to have that sort of support. And also, yeah. That's fantastic. I uh, I used to work on the um, on a group with editor editors kind of like group thing mm -hmm. that you do with this website called pinmop.com. Mm -hmm. And I used to be one of the well, I kind of still am one of their editors. And mm -hmm. I'll be a group of editors that would come in and proofread or edit pieces of manuscripts or essay mm -hmm. class projects for school. And um, it, it really taught me how to do constructive criticism in a very kind and tactful way. Um, yeah. But also help to develop the story. Yeah, like you are completely correct. Like constructive criticism is, it is a, it is a language that you need to learn. Yeah, yes it is, that's true. That's wonderful. Um, so uh, of the publishing forms, hybrid, self-publishing, indie publishing, and traditional, what were your, what were your initial um, favorites? What was your oh, I was, um, I was, I was always like going to go the traditional route um, because I feel that like I am not a hustler. Like, you know, like I am a person who like honestly like, when shit happens, I'm not one of the people who survive. Let's be 100%. Like, I don't have... So, like, I needed, like, just sort of that um, that structure to have other people take care of other things so that I could just be head in the clouds. Because, like, I know myself. I know my personality. I just, like, I am such in awe of, like, people who um, do... Um, self-publishing because like the amount of hustle that that takes the amount of like like just organizational skills or whatever that that takes is awe-inspiring and I know I don't have that like so that's why I was like always traditional for me that's wonderful I am trying to self-publish uh, or hybrid publish I've submitted yeah publishers that offer hybrid publishing so I'll see what they say um, but I am kind of self-published. I even organized my own books to create a, a cover reveal tour. It is happening in April, so I'm really excited about that. Oh, I'm excited about that. Thank Let me you. know. Thank you, absolutely. I even made a teaser trailer about the cover reveal tour that's coming. I posted it on my Instagram. It's, um, I had Alicia Keys Fallen uh, mm -hmm. as back of it. It was very good. And um, I like that I can create a lot of my own media material. It was a lot of times... Mm -hmm. Others have to pay for that. And five, yeah. That, yeah. But I, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. That's a gift to me that I even know that little talent to create the media, the book trailers, the book aesthetics, things like yeah. that. Yeah. 
Yes. Yeah, no, like, and that, that is like a lot of work. It's a lot of, you know, um, organization and all these things. Like, man, kudos to you. Thank you. I'm, I'm working on a, a self-publishing blueprint to share with everyone else. So I want to put everything that I've learned together into like a collection of steps, basically. And it's going to be like this whole big thing. Because I have 17,000 screen captures in my phone of, oh, wow. of all this information about publishing, self-publishing, hybrid, traditional, everything. So I, um, I definitely want to put that together for people. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> Thank you. I'm excited. Okay, we're down to our last two questions. Yes, yes, yes. All right. If you can share, what is your ultimate publishing goal? My ultimate publishing goal? See, that's a, like, my ultimate publishing goal. Like, ultimate, ultimate? Uh-huh. I mean. In a perfect world, what would it lead to? In a perfect world, like, of course, like, as with every other author like I want to be like a number one New York Times bestseller like um but like honestly like I think my my ultimate publishing goal is like when I die like I want people to remember my work and remember it warmly you know like I want people like I want people to be like yeah like that was my whole childhood or that those were my teenage years. I think that's, that's my goal. Like I want to be a feeling. Does that make sense? I love that answer. Yeah. I love that. Yes. It's yeah. Like we have art that defines us, defines the yeah. eras, defines portion of our lives. Yeah. That, that speaks to us and helps develop our, um, our sense of art and yes. ourselves. And even yeah. while the artist is gone, that, that their work is yeah. still. Yeah, I like I want to create it. I think my my whole intention, money aside, because money is very important, let's be real. But like money aside, like I've always wanted to create safe spaces for children and teenagers and really anybody to examine their feelings, to examine like. For me, like the Gilded Ones, for example, is a way to examine like, like feelings about patriarchy, feelings about war, like feelings about what it means to be a woman, right? So like, I think like, I like with this book, like, I wanted to create a safe space for people of all genders, all races, everyone who's like struggling with certain things to find a safe place to sort of examine their feelings about that um and then with my other books like with um the last leviathan i just really want people to like love the ocean and respect the ocean and to also like man just like be happy and like <laughs> be in un like underwater enjoying this world so yeah i love that i love that in your books that means that you know you're putting um uh you know messages for the bigger picture of the real world into your story. Yeah. And and you're you're putting this flair of entertainment on them, but it still has that that hidden message in there for society and for people growing up now who need you know to to uh, to appreciate to appreciate the simpler things and the things that um, need to be protected by us, like nature, like the ocean. Oh yeah, yeah, I know that. I think all of my books have some like there's always like some sort of end goal, like with the gilded ones like for me it was the book of like my anger about being a woman like like you know like when you grow up and like they expect girls to be one way and boys to be another um but as i wrote it um i started to realize and like to sort of examine like my idea of feminism because in like studying about patriarchy and all these things i realized it's not just women who suffer it's men it's like non-binary folks. It's like like everybody suffers in some way because in order to exist in this sort of social contract, like you have to give something up. So like with like women, it's like all these rights. With men, literally it's life expectancy. There's a reason why dudes die earlier than women. And it's because like of all what it means to be a man, you know? So like... 
and then of course with like everybody like who's like in the in between or what what have you like they're just it it's so much worse like you you know so it's like everybody struggles in this sort of society like yeah Yeah. I'm really glad to have had this author interview with you. And we have our, um, we want to know how to be able to find the Nina Forna and more information about the Gilded Ones. Awesome. Um, so you can find me on Twitter and on um, Instagram at Namina Forna like at Namina Forna on Twitter, at Namina.Forna on Instagram. Also, my book is on Goodreads, The Gilded Ones. Um, it's also um, right now on Amazon. You can pre-order it. Um, it comes out May 26th, um, coronavirus willing, in America, and then um, July 7th, I believe, um, in England. Um, and then it's published in different places. As, it'll be published in different places as well. That is wonderful.